The subject of today's session is Isaiah chapter 6. Despite it not being Isaiah chapter 1, it clearly has a critically important role, not only in the book of Isaiah, but in the career of Isaiah. Because what clearly emerges in this chapter is that this is Isaiah's inaugural prophecy. Here, God summons him for a mission, and he responds. So, let's begin our discussion of the chapter. As we'll see, there is an awful lot to discuss. We'll see how much we can manage in the time that we have. We begin by considering the first verses and what they tell us of the setting of this extraordinary encounter between Isaiah and God. Verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw God sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Now, in context, it becomes clear. Seraphim, which is here in English, simply transliterated from the Hebrew, seraphim, is one of the names, perhaps we could say one of the levels, of the angels. Significant to note that this name for the angels appears in all the Bible only here in Isaiah chapter 6. So above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his legs. And with two, he did fly. And one called unto another and said, Holy, 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 is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were moved at the voice of them that called, and the house was filled with smoke. Before we continue in the chapter, let's consider what's taking place here. Obviously, in the opening verse, I saw God. We realize that Isaiah is privy to an extraordinary revelation, seeing God's presence. In considering what takes place in this revelation, I think it's instructive for us to compare Isaiah's inaugural prophecy here in chapter 6 with another inaugural prophecy. In Ezekiel, chapter 1, clearly, Ezekiel, chapter 1, is the inaugural prophecy of the prophet Ezekiel. And at the very least, to excerpt briefly, to get a sense of what takes place here. Now, it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month as I was in the midst of the exile by the river Kabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So of course, I saw visions of God. Inevitably invokes Isaiah speaking of, I saw God sitting upon a throne. I had lifted up. In the continuation in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's exile, the word of God came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans in Babylon, by the river Kvar, and the hand of God was there upon him. Now, in Ezekiel's description of his revelation, there are some marked similarities to what we read in Isaiah chapter 6. And I can't help but add here, as 
an observation at the outset that indeed we have an ancient tradition that what Ezekiel describes is what Isaiah described. Well, on some planes, that does invoke itself. When we consider a number of motifs, most obviously the wings. In Ezekiel's description, we also read in verse 6 of the wings of the angels. In verse 8, they had hands of a man under their wings. And as for the four, so the faces and wings of them, four, their wings were joined to another, their wings were stretched upward. And also, the theme of covering, concealment. Recall how Isaiah described two wings covering their faces, two their legs. Well, in Ezekiel, Two of the wings covered their bodies, the bodies of the angels. So the theme of angels with wings is certainly present in Ezekiel as well. Another theme that inevitably presents itself is the theme of fire, of burning. Seraphim, that word for the angels, that we found invoked twice in Isaiah chapter 6, means in Hebrew, burning. And the theme of burning, likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 13, their appearance was like coals of fire, burning like the appearance of torches. So the angels appear as burning beings in Isaiah and as burning, like the appearance of torches in Ezekiel as well. And of course, the most critical convergence, when we consider the end of the chapter, manifestly a revelation of God's presence. In verse 26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. A throne. Recall, again, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, I saw God sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. That throne has the appearance of a sapphire stone, something transparent. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man upon it above. Now, it is, of course, crucially important for us to appreciate all of the qualifiers here. It is a likeness as the appearance of. But the pinnacle of the revelation is some vision of a man upon it above that the prophet tells us in verse 28 is the appearance of the likeness of, note again the qualifiers, the glory of God. Now we should note the glory of God is not synonymous with God. God is beyond all of that. The glory, in that vein, we can understand as something created by God as means to be able to sense the closeness of God's presence. But of course, it is important for us to appreciate the pinnacle of Ezekiel's inaugural prophecy, as is of course the case in Isaiah's inaugural prophecy, is a vision of the divine. There's an additional dimension that we'll still consider. But before we do, I think it's also instructive for us to note certain glaring differences between what Isaiah describes and what Ezekiel describes. Let's focus upon two. One difference is a difference of number, and it's a glaring difference of number. That is, recall again, in Isaiah, each one had six wings. Two covered the face, 
to the legs, and with two, the seraphim flew. In Ezekiel, verse 6, everyone had four faces, and every one of them had four wings, not six. And indeed, in assigning the roles of these wings in verse 11, we see two wings of everyone were joined to one another, and two covered their bodies. So, of course, we need to understand this glaring divergence between the two visions. Why six and then four? And another very glaring difference between these two visions, and this is more a general sense that one gleans, a theme permeates Ezekiel's vision. And if anything, in Isaiah, not only was it lacking, it was practically the opposite. In Ezekiel, the theme of movement, relentlessly. In verse 4, a stormy wind came out of the north. Verse 9, they turned not when they went. They went, everyone, straight forward. Verse 12, they went, everyone, straight forward. Whither the Spirit go, they went. Slashing up and down. Verse 24, and when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, like the voice of the Almighty, or alternatively, like a mighty noise, a noise of tumult, like the noise of a host. Motion, continuously. And in Isaiah, well, in Isaiah, the emphasis in the opening verse, I saw God sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. There really isn't any indication of motion at all. Why these differences? And I think it's important for us to consider these differences in our appreciating the setting in Isaiah chapter 6. Why the diminished wings in Ezekiel? Our tradition, that again, notes the commonality between what Isaiah saw and what Ezekiel saw, offers the explanation that when Isaiah saw his vision. The temple was standing, established in Jerusalem. When Ezekiel sees his, the temple is on the brink of destruction. Indeed, recall the setting in Ezekiel. The prophet isn't even in the land of Israel, much less in Jerusalem. I was among the captives in the midst of the exile by the river Kvar in Babylon. The theme of exile, again, the second verse, it was the fifth year of King Yoyachin's exile. I was in the land of the Chaldeans, Babylon, by the river Kvar. The vantage point of Ezekiel is critically different, both in time and in place. When you consider what wings signify, of course, it's always important for us to bear in mind we read in the Bible repeatedly anthropomorphic descriptions describing the angels and indeed God himself in human language. Scripture speaks of God having a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Of course, God does not have a body. Neither do angels. But since language is the only tool we have, and an imperfect tool at that, through which to communicate, the prophets use language to describe that which transcends language. So they describe the angels with wings. Angels have wings, but not physical wings. 
just in her physical body. What do the wings signify? Well, we saw in both Isaiah and Ezekiel what the answer to that question is. The wings, on the one hand, signify concealment. Both Isaiah and Ezekiel speak of wings covering. There is something hidden, concealed, transcendent about angels. We, as human beings, don't have the wherewithal to grasp what they are. And the wings signify that concealment. And perhaps in much the same vein, the wings are also the means through which to fly. What does flying mean? What does flying mean to human beings who are stuck on the surface of the earth without being able to go up and down? Flying is a whole new dimension. We are confined to the dimensions of the plane that the angels that have wings are in. Again, transcendence. So the wings of the angels communicate to us that dual message, concealment and transcendence, going beyond. And the angels still go beyond, but not as much when the temple is on the brink of destruction. That God's presence, as beheld by human beings, is in some sense diminished when that bastion of God's presence, mm -hmm. the Holy Temple, is on the verge of destruction. Ezekiel, again, we reiterate, is prophesying specifically in exile in Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. And Isaiah, and this is critical. When Isaiah describes his vision, he tells us God was sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Filled the temple can well mean the actual physical temple. That is, where indeed is Isaiah? When he experiences this extraordinary prophetic experience, very likely, in the temple. In the precincts of the temple where, on the one hand, he beholds the physical temple. On the other, he beholds something far, far beyond. He beholds the vision of God, as it were, upon his throne. Now, when we consider what Isaiah beholds from this vantage point in or near the temple, beholding this prophetic experience, there's another critically important subtlety, and that is the timing. The chapter begins with the words, in the year that King Uzziahu died, which, of course, could simply mean that it was the year in which Uzziahu died. Recall that in chapter 1, when we read the time frame in which Isaiah prophesies, the first king who is mentioned in whose reign Isaiah prophesied was King Uzziahu. Maybe the overlap was minimal. Isaiah began to prophesy just right before Uzziahu's death. That is a possibility. There is, however, another possibility. And here again, I share with you an ancient tradition that the year that Uzziahu died refers not to his death, but rather to his undoing. I remind you in our introduction to Isaiah, we discussed 
the circumstances of King Uziahu's undoing. Let's consider it again. In the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 26, where we read in fairly great detail about the reign of Uziahu, and in particular, we read the details of an episode to which only brief reference is made in the book of Kings. I'm beginning in verse 3. Sixteen years old was Uziah when he began to reign, reign, 52 years in Jerusalem. In other words, he had a long reign, a long opportunity to accomplish his achievements. In verse 4, and he did that which was upright in the eyes of God, according to all his father Amatia had done. Verse 5, and he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the vision of God. And as long as he sought God, God made him prosper. And from verse 5 through verse 15, we read a lengthy and detailed description of King Uziahu's prosperity, his great successes. And then, in verse 16, his undoing. So when he was strong, his heart was lifted up so that he did corruptly. And he trespassed against God, his Lord. For he came into the temple of God to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now, as we've noted, it could have been good intentions. It could have been King Uziel seeking some outlet for his tremendous feelings of thanksgiving to God. But the outlet was illicit. Only the priests are permitted to bring incense upon the incense altar. And indeed, in verse 17 and 18, Azariah, the priest, the chief priest, came in after him, and with him fourscore priests of God, who were valiant men, and they withstood Uziah the king, and said to him, It pertains not to you, Uziah, to burn incense unto God, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated, it pertains to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed, neither shall it be for your honor from God the Lord. And verse 19, Uziah does not forbear. Then Uziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was wroth with the priests, divine punishment strikes. What is usually translated as, let's say, an affliction of the skin, Sara'at, broke forth on his forehead before the priests in the house of God, beside the altar of incense. Sara'at is one of the chief forms of defilement. One afflicted is forbidden to come into the encampment of Israel, much less into the holy temple. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous. He was smitten with Sarat in his forehead, and they thrust him out quickly from them. He himself made haste also to go out, because God had smitten him. And Uziahu remained smitten with Sarat until his dying day. So again, when we read at the beginning of chapter 6, in the year that King Uziah died, was it his death or his undoing? There's an additional dimension that inevitably comes to bear here. And that becomes most dramatically manifest in verse 4. After the call of the angels, holy, 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 is the God of hosts, which perhaps we can see as the response of the heavens to the profanation the desecration that resulted from Uziahu's act. In verse 4, and the posts of the door 
were moved at the voice of them that called, and the house was filled with smoke. The temple, the physical temple, is shaking, and the temple fills with smoke. What's going on? What may well be going on here is an earthquake. This isn't merely conjecture. That is the juxtaposition of the earthquake with King Guziyahu's trespass is inevitably something that is not explicit in scripture. But the earthquake in the time of King Uziahu isn't conjecture at all. In the first verse of Amos, we read the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, Amos tells us nothing with respect to the magnitude of the earthquake, much less its timing, but we can perhaps glean a more informative answer to those questions from the other prophet who explicitly makes reference to this earthquake. That other prophet is Zechariah. In the last chapter of Zechariah, we read of the final battle of the nations against God here in Jerusalem. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 14, Behold, the day of God comes when your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city will go forth into exile. But the residue of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. In verse 4, And his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will cleft in the midst thereof. The mountain splits, opening up a very great valley. Verse 5, And you will flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach unto Tzal. Yea, you shall flee like you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. So first of all, the earthquake explicitly took place in the days of Uzziah. Second of all, with respect to the magnitude of this earthquake, consider that the prophet Zechariah is prophesying in the second temple period. Between him and Uzziah is a chasm of centuries, including an exile, dispersion, and restoration. And consider that the national consciousness of this earthquake was so indelibly etched in the minds of the people of Israel that when Zechariah says to them, you remember the earthquake in the time of Uzziah? It'll be that bad. You'll be fleeing like on the day of the earthquake. They understood. So again, it was a massive earthquake. Takes place in the time of Uzziah. When in the time of Uzziah? Not explicit. In our tradition, just then. When Uziah violated the boundary lines that God had established with respect to the priests and Israel. Consequence? The angels call out, holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. And the earth reacts by quaking. This picture actually has an earlier precedent. Another earthquake about which we read, albeit not exactly in those words, 
much earlier on. In Numbers chapter 16, another attempt to violate the boundary lines that God established with respect to the priesthood. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. Now Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Hath, the son of Levi, with Datan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuven, took men. And verse 3, they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon you. Seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. God is among them. Why then lift yourselves up above the assembly of God? The attempt to violate those boundaries. And what is the consequence? As Moses says to the people in verse 28, Hereby you shall know that God had sent me to do all these works, and that I have not done them of my own mind. If these people die the common death of all men, and be visited after the visitation of all men, then God has not sent me. But, if God makes a new thing, and the ground opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down alive into the grave, then you will understand that these men have provoked God. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground cleaved asunder under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up in their households, and all the men that appertained of the Torah, and all their goods. So they, and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the grave, and the earth closed upon them, and they were lost from among the assembly. Earthquake. When people violate the boundaries that God establishes, sometimes the consequences the earth itself, in recoiling from this trespass, violates its own boundaries. And the earth quakes and even swallows up the violators. So now again, returning on this score to Isaiah chapter 6. When the prophet says, the posts of the door were moved, that the voice of them that called in the house was filled with smoke, the temple literally shook. The house filled with smoke, perhaps because the jarring of the altar caused a plume of smoke to rise up from upon it. Maybe, likewise, when we read in verse 6, then flew unto me one of the seraphim with a glowing stone in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from off the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin atoned for. If we would have been there, standing right next to the prophet, what would we have seen? We don't know, but perhaps we might have seen that after the building quaked, a glowing coal from the quaking altar flew off the altar, hit the prophet in the mouth. And all of us would have thought, look, a burning coal is flying through the air and hitting the prophet in the mouth. The prophet sees it's not just burning coal flying through the air. It is one of the seraphim taking that glowing coal from upon the altar and touching his lips to tell him your iniquity is taken away and your sin is atoned for. But the prophet is operating on both levels simultaneously. He can see what we might see standing next to him. But he also sees an additional level of meaning that to us 
would of course be concealed. Now, an additional dimension that we should stress that especially pertains to what we've been discussing with respect to Uziahu's trespass and the ancient tradition that that circumstance occasioned this revelation to Isaiah. There's another tantalizing hint that we should consider. It goes back to verse 3. And one, one of the seraphim, called unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We should always, of course, be conscious that the whole earth is full of God's glory. And I'll note that we Jews in our daily prayers repeat this verse on a minimum of four occasions daily, affirming that indeed the whole earth is full of God's glory. But there's an additional connotation here. When the angels need to emphasize the whole earth is full of God's glory, on the one hand, it could be because someone somewhere is violating that holiness, violating that glory. And on the other hand, the whole earth is full of God's glory, specifically when evildoers are punished. Let's consider where this expression, the earth being full of God's glory, appears elsewhere in Scripture. First place is in Numbers chapter 14, following the sin of the spies and Moses interceding with God on behalf of the people, lest God destroy them all. And God's response to Moses' plea in chapter 14 of Numbers, verse 20 God said, I have pardoned according to your word, but pardon is only partial. In very deed, as I live, and all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Same expression. Surely, all those men that have seen my glory and my signs, which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have tested me these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. The punishment. The punishment comes, and the consequence of the punishment, the earth will be filled with the glory of God. That is, precisely when evil receives its just deserts, we see the glory of God. Because it is, after all, the evildoer who has violated that glory of God. That, of course, we should always stress, isn't for God, it's for us, to be able to sense God's divinity in the world. When evil prospers, our ability to sense God's presence is diminished. When evil is punished, the glory of God fills the earth. Similarly, in the prophecy of Habakkuk, in chapter 2, stern words of rebuke, in verse 9, Woe to him who gains evil gains for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the hand of evil. And likewise, in verse 12, woe to him that builds a town with blood and establishes a city by iniquity. There is punishment. In verse 11, the stone will cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. In verse 13, behold, is it not of the God of hosts? 
that people toil until they are sated with fire, and the nations weary themselves for vanity, punishment. Verse 14, once the perpetrators of evil receive their just deserts, for earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the seabed. Again, the earth is filled with God's glory when evil receives its just due. And one additional example. In Psalm 72, we read about the king. A psalm of Solomon, give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness unto the king's son. In verse 4, may he judge the poor of the people and save the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. In verse 9, let them that dwell in the wilderness, or alternatively, let the nobles bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall render tribute. The kings of Shiva, Shiva and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall prostrate themselves before him. All nations shall serve him. The victory over all earthly forces, over the oppressor, and all those who claim dominion for themselves. And the consequence of that, Verse 18, blessed be God, the Lord, the God of Israel, who does wonders alone. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Again, when evil receives its just deserts, when that which had diminished our ability to sense the glory of God in the world is cast aside. The glory of God fills the earth. Uziahu, irrespective of his possibly good intentions, did that which was wrong in the sight of God. He is punished. And the whole earth is filled with God's glory. Indeed, we'll note briefly that this theme of the punishment of evil being attended to God's glory being revealed is a recurrent theme throughout the Bible. Consider in brief, in Exodus chapter 14, the Egyptians are in hot pursuit of the Israelites. And God says to Moses in chapter 14, verse 16, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and cleave it. And the children of Israel will come into the midst of the sea on dry ground. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will come in after them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh, and through all his hosts, and through his chariots, and through his horsemen. Verse 18, and the Egyptians will know that I am God, when I will be glorified through Pharaoh, and through his chariots, and through his horsemen. The punishment of the wicked, and God's name is glorified for all the world, even the Egyptians, to see. In the last chapter of Isaiah, Likewise, we read of God's punishment of evil. In verse 14, God will have indignation against his enemies. Verse 15, for behold, God will come in fire and his chariots will be like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Verse 16, for by fire, God will enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and the slain of God will be many. All the evildoers, in verse 17, will be consumed together, says God. And what happens after that? Verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time comes that I will gather all nations and tongues, 
and they shall come and see my glory. And those who are refugees of God's wrath will then go to all the nations, all those who have never seen God's glory and declare God's glory among the nations. When the evil are punished, we're able to sense the blessing of God's divinity in the world. Likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 38, one description of that final battle against Jerusalem, the war of Gog and Magog, and in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, verse 21, I will call for a sword against him, against Gog, throughout all my mountains. Says the Lord God, every man's sword against his brother. And I will enter into judgment with him, with pestilence and with blood. I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him, an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am God. And likewise, the similar description of that final battle in Zechariah chapter 14, the continuation of what we saw just a few moments ago, that after God goes forth and fights against those nations, as when he fights in the day of battle, verse 9, and God will be king over all the earth in that day. God will be one, and his name one. So again, all of this is setting, context, the background of what Isaiah describes, what occasions this extraordinary revelation that Isaiah experiences. Ironically, his inaugural prophecy can be seen as a divine response to the trespass that demands the call of the angels that the whole earth is full of God's glory. But now, where does that lead? In verse 8, we see the divine summons and the prophet's response. And I heard the voice of God saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. The prophet discerns that the divine summons is directed at him. In verse 9, and he, God, said, Go and tell this people, You hear indeed, but understand not. You see indeed, but know, but perceive not. Verse 10, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and understanding with their heart return and be healed because they're not doing that. Their eyes are fat, their ears are heavy, their eyes are shut. Seems like such a devastating situation. No one will even listen. And you know, here again, the comparison to the inaugural prophecy of Ezekiel is instructive. We're not in chapter 1 anymore. We are rather in chapter 2. Following what we already saw, in chapter 2, verse 1, He, God, said unto me, Son of man, stand upon your feet and I will speak with you. In Isaiah, the prophet experiences a summons as a question. Ezekiel experiences it as a charge. In verse 3, he said unto me, Son of man, I send you to the children of Israel. 
to rebellious nations that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. And the children are brazen-faced and stiff-hearted. I do send you unto them. And you will say to them, Thus says God the Lord. And what will it accomplish? Possibly nothing. Verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house. They may not even hear anything. Yet shall know that there had been a prophet among them. And one wonders, so what? They may not even listen to anything. We'll consider that in a moment. One additional prophecy in Ezekiel that is perhaps especially apropos given the expressions that we saw in Isaiah chapter 6. In Ezekiel chapter 12, the word of God also came unto me saying, verse 2, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of the rebellious house that have eyes to see and see not that have ears to hear, and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. And in verse 3, the prophet is commanded to enact for them a dramatic illustration of going into exile. Is it going to accomplish anything? Very possibly not. It may be they will perceive that it may be that they won't for they are a rebellious house. So what's the point? Indeed, what will it accomplish? What will be gained simply by them knowing that there had been a prophet among them? We return to Isaiah chapter 6. The prophet, in a way, asks the same question. In verse 11, I said, Lord, how long? All I'm going to be doing is calling upon them futilely, vainly, uselessly, and their heart is fat, their ears are heavy, their eyes are shut, nothing is going to be accomplished. How long? And he answered, Until cities be waste without inhabitants, and houses without man, and the land become utterly waste. Verse 12. And God will have removed men far away, and the forsaken places be many in the midst of the land. Verse 13. And if there be yet a tenth in it, it shall again be eaten up. Even that last remnant appears to be completely devoured. But devoured as a terebinth and an oak whose stock remains when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed will be the stock thereof. What is he saying? In context, the most appropriate understanding is the likeness to the terebinth and the oak is still and all the consolation, the silver lining, if you will. Because the terebinth and the oak are, of course, deciduous trees. They shed their leaves every fall. And after they've shed their leaves, what remains? Only the stock, only the tree trunk. And for all appearances, the tree is dead. Nothing is left. Oh, but 
Yes. It is alive, and much is left. The tree isn't dead. It's just dormant. You don't know that. In the fall, when they cast their leaves, it looks like all is lost. But you know the spring is coming. And when the spring comes, that seemingly dead trunk will put forth branches and leaves once again. It's not lost. So the holy seed will be the stock thereof. In other words, you're calling upon them, and for all appearances, you're achieving nothing. For all appearances, again, the heart is fat, the ears are heavy, the eyes are shut, nothing. But they will know, as God says to Ezekiel in chapter 2, that there had been a prophet among them that may not have any immediate consequence. But ultimately, what is going to be left is the holy seed, the holy seed that will endure and that will once again blossom and flourish. Because you communicated the message. And maybe the metaphor of seed in here is especially relevant. What, after all, does prophet, or for that matter, teacher, do other than planting seeds? And neither prophet nor teacher may, for the most part, know what becomes of those seeds. Does anything sprout of them? But the day will come when the Holy Seed indeed blossoms. And the words that the prophet had proclaimed to deaf ears and blind eyes will be heard and seen and will transform. It's significant to note that among the prophets, in particular, in Isaiah, the theme of the seed is a dramatically recurrent one. Just to consider in brief some of the many examples, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, who loved me. God says in verse 9, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you away. And therefore, verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I encourage you. I help you. I uphold you with my righteous hand. For I, God your Lord, hold your right hand who says unto you, fear not, I help you. And indeed, likewise, in chapter 43, verse 5, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west and from the north and from the south. The seed will be saved. It will be brought back. It will not be forever cast away. In Isaiah chapter 45, in verse 19, I have not spoken in secret in a place of the land of darkness. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek you me in vain. Not in vain. I, God, speak righteousness. I declare things that are upright. And in verse 25, in God shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. And again, in Isaiah chapter 61, in verse 9, their seed will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. 
All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed that God has blessed. In chapter 65, verse 9, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. And my chosen will inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Verse 23, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for terror, for they are the seed, blessed of God, and their offspring with them. And this is a recurrent theme, not only focusing specifically on the seed, but on that which is preserved. First, in Isaiah chapter 37, in verses 31 and 32, this is specifically focusing upon the promise of salvation after the onslaught of Sancheriv, of Sennacherib. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion they that shall escape. The zeal of the God of hosts shall perform this. Indeed, just a couple of chapters ago, we read this theme of those that are escaped. Those that are escaped of Israel. In verse 3, it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written unto life in Jerusalem. Recall the holy seed in the final verse of Isaiah chapter 6. And indeed, the theme of those who escape, those who remain, isn't only in Isaiah. In Joel chapter 3, verse 5, in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those that escape, as God has said, and among the remnant, those whom God will call in Ovadiah chapter 1, verse 17, in Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy. Note the place is here. There is an ongoing battle against God, against Jerusalem. We saw it. We saw it in Ezekiel chapter 38. We saw it in Zechariah chapter 14. We see it before our very eyes. But again, there is the promise in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem. There will be those who escape and it shall be holy. The holy seed. The prophet's words are not in vain. And by way of conclusion, we should consider precisely in what vein the prophet's words connect with that final note of consolation. Consider in Isaiah chapter 44, beginning in verse 1, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, that Israel, whom I have chosen, thus says God who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. Whence the salvation? Verse 3. For as I will pour water upon the thirsty land and streams upon the dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. How am I going to pour my spirit upon your seed? Because I'm sending the prophets. I'm sending the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets. And even if they're prophesying to people who have hearts that are fat and ears that are heavy and eyes that are shut, through them, 
I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. And likewise, perhaps with greater specificity, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, and as for me, this is my covenant with them, says God, my spirit that is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed's seed, says God, from henceforth and forever. It's not just the spirit. It is the word. The word that I put in the mouths of the prophets that will not depart from their mouths or the mouths of their seed or their seed seed ever. The words will not be in vain. The seeds that they plant will sprout. And you know, ultimately on that theme of seed, we should appreciate it's not only about Israel. And with this we conclude. Returning to the final chapter of Isaiah. And they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for an offering unto God upon horses and chariots in litters, upon mules, upon swift beasts, or with joyous song, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says God, as the children of Israel bring their offering in a pure vessel unto the house of God. Verse 21, and of them also will I take for the priests and for the Levites, says God. In other words, of them, of those who are being brought, and of those who are bringing them, of all the nations. Verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says God, so shall your seed and your name remain. So, in considering then the broad picture, the broad canvas of this extraordinary prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, perhaps best exemplifying how much is wrong, how much is falling between our fingers. And the prophet indeed exclaims in verse 5, I'm a man of defiled lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of defiled lips. And if this chapter is all about my taking upon myself the role as a prophet to express God's word, I'm of defiled lips. They're of defiled lips. How can we even begin? And God gives the prophet a sign, the glowing coal from upon the altar, smacks him in the mouth. The angel tells him, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. But it still hasn't resolved the problem. The people, after all, are also of defiled lips. The people, after all, hear, but don't understand. See, but don't know, don't perceive. Everything is shut. Is there any point? It will be. When we are sent by God, there will always be a final conclusion, a final goal, a final guarantee. Again, as the terebinth and the oak, whose stock remains when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed will be the stock thereof. It will not be in vain. And the words of the prophet 
will indeed provide that basis, that promise, we will see God's glory. We will feel his blessing. Through that, we have the opportunity to be the seed blessed by God. God bless you.